these latter child at home days, I have only one Halloween de decoration left. And I still have it because it's really scary. It's a big blow up snake. And every year, about a week before Halloween, I blow it up and post it in the bushes by our front door. <laughs> it scares the kids coming for candy, who are totally oblivious to ghouls, witches, ghosts, and screaming animatrons. It also scares their parents, the UPS man, the Mormon missionaries, and whoever else comes to our door. It has even scared me, and I put it there. It doesn't scare the people who look at it directly. It is all too obviously a blow-up snake. Instead, it scares people who only get a little glimpse out of the corner of their eye. They jump, they often have their hands on their heart when I open the door, and I know exactly what has happened. By, the time, by that time, of course, they have also noticed how obviously fake this snake is, and they are a bit sheepish and they explain through their hard breathing how it all happened. So what's up with this? Well, what's up is that we human beings, like many animals, have a built-in snake alert system. Our eye glimpses a snake shape, and before the thinking brain even gets the signal, the lower brain has compared this shape with its short list of serious threats to life and limb and set, sent the danger alert to the body, which then jumps away and loads up on adrenaline in preparation for running. By the time the running might actually commence, however, the higher brain has finally received the message and noted that this is a plastic blow-up snake or a rope or a stick or whatever and repressed the urge to run, <clears throat> leaving a body full of adrenaline and a pounding heart. No doubt this has happened to you. Many other animals have a similar snake alert module. It is a preset automatic response, these modules, to certain kinds of events. It is there because snakes posed a particular problem to the survival of the species for a very long time in the evolutionary history, and those who were, who were extra fast at snake detection survived and reproduced. Nobody has to teach people to fear snakes. You have to teach people not to fear snakes, although most people don't feel motivated to take the trouble, and then they are afraid of snakes all their lives, even though in these latter days it would be much smarter to be afraid of getting into the car or picking up a beer can, activities so much more dangerous than snakes, you don't even want to know. So what does this have to do with morality? Well, it appears that the human being is also provided with morality modules, preset responses to certain kinds of human events which were once a threat to the species. They draw our attention to those threats and often provide us with an intuitive negative response, such as repulsion or anger. This is the biological basis of human morality. We know that these modules exist because even babies have them. And how do we know that since babies don't talk yet? Well, we know that babies come equipped to expect certain things. The tabla rasa baby, complete blank slate, is a thing of the past. We know that babies expect certain things and will stare longer at things that contradict those expectations than they will at things that they might have predicted. For instance, Babies come from the womb expecting the elementary laws of physics. If you prop a two-month-old baby up and show them, for instance, what appears to be a toy block and a toy car, they will watch a while and look away. If you show them what seems to be a toy car passing through the toy block, they will stare for much longer than they will stare if the car passes behind the toy block. Even two-month-old babies expect it to be impossible for a car to pass through a solid block. Someday now, a baby will be born in a space station, and that baby will be born with a module expecting gravity. We all are. But life will quickly teach her differently, and she will revise her gravity expectation module. 
She will learn to expect people to have float around because that's what she sees. Our mental modules are not our destiny. They are our first draft. Babies also have moral modules that lead them to expect, for instance, that people will be cared for. This moral module can be overwritten, but it is nearly universal in babies. In an experiment demonstrating this, researchers put on puppet shows for six to ten month old infants that, in which a climber, which was a wooden shape that had googly eyes glued to it, a climber struggled to climb up a hill. Sometimes a second puppet came along and helped the climber from below. Other times a different puppet appeared at the top of the hill and bashed repeatedly the climber back down the slope. Elementary human drama, right? Then a few minutes later the infant saw a new puppet show. This time the climber looked back and forth between the helper puppet and the hinderer puppet and decided to cozy up to the hinderer puppet. To the infants, this was the social equivalent of seeing a car pass through a solid block. It made no sense, and the infants stared far longer than when the climber decided to cozy up to the helper puppet. Ten months old, huh? Pretty smart, these kids. A moral psychologist named Jonathan Haidt thinks that he has found six such moral modules. Inborn expectations about what is morally dangerous and by extension, what is good. I'll tell you more about the details of what he calls our six moral taste buds in the second part of the sermon, but for the moment, I'll just say that, that how we make moral decisions is going to depend on the relative strength of each moral module for an individual, and which have been modified by experience and teaching, and which have not. One interesting thing this theory does is explain some of the basic disconnect between liberals and conservatives in this nation. A disconnect which conservatives tend to explain by calling liberals stupid and which liberals tend to explain as a matter of poor mental health on the part of conservatives. I find hate, by the way, this is H-A-I-D-T, hate's explanation much more interesting and much more likely and much more hopeful for this name-calling impasse is resulting in a pretty broken nation, don't you think? Very complicated theory. I'm only going to be able to skim the surface this morning. If you're interested in following up on the theory and the research done to establish it, the name of the book is in your order of service after the quotation on the top of the page. Before we get into the six moral taste buds, we have to quickly address how we make moral decisions at all. I'm going to challenge you here, so just get ready. We would like to think that we make moral decisions using our rational brain. Philosophers have urged this on us for centuries. It just seems like, well, the higher way to go. We think we make judgments by judging, by weighing evidence and consequences, by computing the greatest good for the greatest number, by pondering what we know, questioning what we've been told, and otherwise thinking. We try not to let our emotions or our intuitions get in the way of our moral judgments, we think, and when people do that, they're often told that they are being subjective, which is bad, and, objective, and rather than being objective, which is good. It's a nice theory, and as, about, as you're about to hear, it's a very old one, but it's total bunk. We make moral judgments the way we see snakes. We make rather instant, non-reflective verdicts on what is good and what is bad. Sometimes we go back and revise those judgments, if we have the energy and the motivation, or begin to experience reality very differently, like the baby born in the space station. Some of this revision is intellectual, but even most of the revision is emotional. Many a man has revised his moral judgment about the proper place of women in the world because his daughter was admitted to law school. And many a woman has revised her condemnation of homosexuality when her son came out as gay. Mostly, when we use our rational thinking brains in moral judgments, we use them to invent rationalizations for why our initial judgment was correct. You too. Even people who are supposed to be professionals at making judgments, like 
judges, for instance, can be shown that they are making decisions with much more subjectivity than the theories of rationalism suggest they should. If you want an extended discussion of the science behind all this, I refer you to Jonathan Haidt's book. This is yet another way in which modern science and understanding is a challenge to rationalism in which Unitarian Universalism is deeply imbued. Once we UUs prided ourselves on being rational about everything, including our moral judgments and our spiritual lives. Now science is telling us that we are at best only a little bit more rational about second guessing our moral judgments than most people are. But even then, we're fooling ourselves about what's going on. In this, we have a long and proud lineage as the reading will demonstrate. When I sat down to actually write this sermon yesterday, I realized that I had promised more than I could deliver in 20 minutes, so I apologize in advance. I propose then this morning to explain the theory in this sermon and apply it to politics directly next time. I might even write a campaign speech. <laughs> this morning, I invite you to use those curious minds and open hearts of yours to learn a little bit more about yourselves and the people of our world. I've spent all week listening to the news with new ears myself. Maybe you will too. Jonathan Haidt and his colleagues propose that we have six moral modules inborn and operant in all but a few persons until modified by life experience or conscious thought. It would take six sermons to prove this to you, but each of these was arrived at through careful experimentation, such as the experiment with infants and the puppets, and also careful thought to how this module might have produced evolutionary advantage. Hate proposes that just like our real taste buds work together to produce a sensation of taste in the real complex world of a particular food, which might be a little salty, a little meaty, with a little satisfying hint of sweet in the barbecue sauce, for instance, so these individual moral modules work together to produce intuitive moral judgments on the complex things that we observe in life. We almost all have the same capacity for taste, but some people have very sensitive taste buds for bitter, say. Most children do, that's why they don't like eating their vegetables. While other people pride themselves on having acquired a taste for bitter. And these differences in proportion and sensitivity of taste buds account for how one person likes a gin and tonic, which is bitter, while another approves of a margarita, which is sweet, sour, and salty together. How we taste is a great metaphor for how we make moral judgments. Almost all of us have the same modules, but in different strengths, and all have been modified by learning and by experience. We all, for instance, have an instinct for valuing group cohesion. Some of us are taught that the group should be the family and no other or larger group matters in the least. Most people feel a kinship with nation. Those people are enjoying flying their American flags this weekend. Others have come to think, often as a result of emotional disappointment with nation, that the important group is the world, the sentiment of the hymn that we just sang. How many people get all emotional about that hymn? Mm -hmm. The sense that the group we should cohere to is the primary difference between liberals and conservatives in this nation. Conservative focus is on family and nation. Liberals value a more expansive understanding of group. Conservatives tend to disvalue the greater humanity, and that's a problem. Liberals tend to disvalue the needs of family and nation, and that's a problem too. So let's unpack these six moral taste buds. They are, number one, a need to care for and an abhorrence of neglect of the vulnerable. Second, a focus on loyalty to the group 
and an abhorrence of traitors and apostates. Third, a need to be treated fairly and to hate cheaters. Fourth, a respect for leadership and authority and a need for leadership and authority to be legitimate and helpful to the group, as well as a disdain for defiance. Fifth, a desire to be free and autonomous and an anger at oppression. Sixth, a focus on sacred values. That's not just religious values, but whatever the culture has taught should be treated with reverence, such as the human body, for instance, and an instinctive feeling of disgust at things we believe will make us impure. What we're going to find is that classical political liberalism is based on a little bit of, six, of three of these six modules and large amounts of three others. Libertarianism is based on only one module, which probably accounts for why most people find libertarian dis libertarianism distasteful and extreme, while still agreeing that liberty is a good thing. Classical conservatism is based on fairly equal amounts of all six values. There are differences between, about specifics between liberals and conservatism with each model, module. For instance, liberals and conservatives all deplore unfairness. Liberals have lately learned to be bothered when a few people get more than their share of wealth. That's what seems most unfair to liberals these days. Conservatives have lately learned to be bothered when too many people get subsistence assistance at the bottom of the economic ladder. What these two groups have in common is caring about unfairness. Really, liberals and conservatives are not two different species. To look at these areas in a little more detail. The first moral module inclines human beings to value caring, especially for vulnerable children and avoiding harm to them. The evolutionary necessity of this module for a species in which children are born virtually helpful, helpless is obvious. This is the module which causes our outrage at dying children being carried out of bombing scenes and sets us collecting clothing for hurricane victims. We are programmed, almost all of us, to a certain level of care for the vulnerable. Now, who fits into that category is something that we learn and teach as a society. Does it include frogs who ought not to be tortured by little boys? Depends. Profoundly handicapped children? Adults who just can't get it together to work productively? These are judgments people make differently depending on the relative strength of this moral module and what they have been taught it applies to. By and large, people with the most expansive and developed care modules are politically liberal, but conservatives are motivated by care also. The second module is being loyal to the group and avoiding betraying the group. This involving loyalty to the group and disdain for anyone who betrays it. Just as babies are born helpless and must be protected, humans are nearly useless alone and must band together to survive. Tribes, groups, our people are nearly, are really, really important. And traitors are even worse than enemies from other groups and tribes. We are pre-programmed to enjoy cohesive groups. That's the main reason we love team sports and is no small player in politics. I experienced this pleasure in group cohesiveness at last week's solar eclipse, which I watched at Elena Gallegos Park, along with more people than I have ever seen at Elena Gallegos Park in all my 24 years here, who were sharing their dark glasses and giving turns at their telescopes and ooing and aahing and cheering together. It was not just fun to see the sun. It was deeply satisfying to be a part of such a cohesive group. On the other side of the group coin is that we are pre-programmed to despise traitors, to shun those who are different, and to attempt to bully those different drummers into line. This dark side of group cohesiveness is often what liberals focus on. Conservative moral taste buds don't take the issues of individual rights so seriously and tend rather to emphasize the functions of pulling together. We see how this is much easier, makes it much easier for Republicans to get all their legislators to vote in a block. Democratic legislators are much less cohesive by nature. This could be seen as a problem for liberalism. 
Another important thing a group must have is norms about fairness. That is to say, if a group of people work together on a project, all working about as hard, most adults want everyone in the group to re be rewarded about the same. If some people obviously work harder or contribute more, most people will want them to be rewarded more. And if some people are not contributing at all, the group mind gets worried. If non-contributors are rewarded in spite of non-contributing, then the number of people who won't cooperate may go up and necessary tasks won't get done. This is a problem in prehistoric groups. The group mind tends also to get worried when some people are rewarded way out of proportion to their contribution. If everybody works but only a few work, reap the rewards, group morale goes down. We are pre-wired to notice these things. You can see this in any family of young children where there is a pie to be cut and distributed. As I mentioned before, this moral taste bud is expressed differently in the conservative person than in the liberal one. Liberals care about fairness, but they tend to emphasize their care module and so support things like Medicaid for poor children. What could be more fair and caring after all? But that does indeed give poor parents something that other parents must pay for. Conservatives believe that the welfare state breaks human cohesiveness. It has certainly broken human cohesiveness for them, and that's everybody's problem. For groups of more than a few people to survive, good leadership is necessary, and that has left the human being with a moral taste bud for respecting and obeying legitimate authority, on the one hand, and a moral taste bud that is angered by bullying, exploitive, or illegitimate leadership, on the other. This works with another taste bud, the freedom oppression taste bud, to keep the larger groups that humanity developed in early agricultural periods as functional as possible balancing the needs of the group with the needs of individuals. Liberals and conservatives are all very keen on the freedom oppression taste bud, although they tend to drift to different markers to measure this. Conservatives have lately latched on to freedom from taxes as the most important measure of freedom, whereas liberals tend to value freedom of speech, expression, including sexual expression, religion, and other less tangible measures of freedom. Liberals have hypersensitive taste buds for illegitimate authority, deploring anything they think of as demagoguery or overweening power. On the other hand, conservatives are much more keen than liberals on respecting authority, honoring elders, and generally manage better in a hierarchy. They are stronger for this, not only because these values resonate with many Americans, but because they get further with their agendas. The final moral taste bud, which seems inborn to the human being, is one which honors sanctity and avoids degradation. We humans have an automatic disgust response, which probably still serves us well to avoid things that might make us sick, such as spoiled food, sick people, dead bodies, and excrement, but which also make us feel dirty or polluted when something we feel sacred is violated. Remember Abu Ghraib? Your disgust at the degradation of those principles comes from your sanctity mode. Remember that these moral modules are a sort of first draft of morality, which is modified over time. Parents and healthcare workers get over their inborn feeling of disgust at bodily fluids when the need to give care requires it. Cultural liberals have convinced themselves that they should get over their feeling of disgust and pollution when sacred values are violated or exploited in the name of free speech, free enterprise, and artistic expression. Think of the flag-burning controversy of the 60s, the crucifix in the urine phot jar photography in that art gallery in Cincinnati, and numerous other cultural wars of late. Conservative, cultural conservatives cry, is nothing sacred? And that's an interesting point. But liberals have their reverence, too, the, our first hymn being a good example. So two big takeaways from this sermon. First, we make moral decisions reflexively, emotionally, and quickly. If we want to bring reason into the process, we must do so after the fact and be rather strict with ourselves. Secondly, we have six moral taste buds pre-programmed in the human being, and then changed by what we are taught as children, and then by our experience, conversation, and thought as our lives unfold. 
Liberalism banks very heavily on three, care, freedom, and justice. Conservatives and virtually all the other world's people who are not educated in the uni European tradition bank on those three and three more, sanctity, group cohesion, and respect for authority, all three of which are sometimes treated as disvalues by liberalism. If we want to understand each other and weave back the fabric of this nation, this are, these are important understandings, and I commend this book to you. And now that I've figured out the differences between liberals and conservatives, why I, like so many people, don't seem to really fit in either category, well, maybe it's time to run for president. <laughs>